Good morning, everyone. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and we are talking about brazen acts of beauty. Um, so pretty amazing. We um, will begin with, uh, you know, welcome to all of you. I'm Pastor Barbara Kane at Holy Redeemer Church in Newark, and it's wonderful to have you all here. Yeah. Okay, so we will begin with uh, Frederick will play for us. Um, our call to worship, or no, first we have a call to worship with Natane. So, please rise as you are able. May we find courage here. Courage, courage to follow, follow our call. Courage to live out to our, live faith. our faith. May we find hope here. Hope for a better, for a better world. world. Hope, Hope that we're to let go. Let us go. May we find truth here. Truth that lives in the sacred community. Truth that lives in ancient stories. May we find all that we seek. And in our seeking, may we know God. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome. Welcome. <gasps> Welcome to worship. Oh my. I get my I get this thing caught in my earring all the time. Okay. Welcome to you. <laughs> if you are male or female or a little bit of each, queer or straight, or a little bit of each. 
old or young, or a little bit of each, rich or poor, a little bit of each, black, brown, or white, or a little bit of each, doubting or believing, or a little bit of each. Welcome to worship. All right, I had you sit down too soon. <laughs> it's one of those mornings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they call that Lutheran aerobics. You've heard that? Yeah, okay. There are very few things as powerful as a group of people that admits they are not perfect and ask for grace as they grow. Imagine what our world might be like if every institution had such a weekly rhythm. Friends, we can light the way. Let us be brave in our truth-telling and honest in our confession, for we will always be met by grace. Let us pray. Jesus of Nazareth, we admit that often we tuck our faith into our pockets, hiding in a place of comfort rather than proudly declaring, yes, we are Christian, yes, we believe, yes, this faith has changed me. We are so afraid of offending others or embarrassing ourselves that we have established rules. No faith at the dinner table, no faith in politics, no faith with strangers. Forgive us for whispering when we could be singing. Forgive us for staying quiet when we could be part of rewriting the narrative. We want to be brave. We want to pour out our perfume over your feet. These things we pray. Amen. Family of faith, hear this good news. Even in our silence, God loves us. Even in our fear or shame, God chooses us. Even when we sin, God wraps us in grace. You are free to be bold, to be brazen, to be exactly who God called you to be. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now you may be seated again. Let us pray. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open your hand, heart open your hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love giving, given to all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament this reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. In it, we hear that the prophet declares that long ago, God performed mighty deeds and delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage through the waters of the sea. Now God is about to do a new thing, bringing the exiles out of Babylon and through the wilderness in a new exodus. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, whom I formed for myself, 
so that, that they may declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join uh, me in reading Psalm 126 responsively. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. Hi, kids. Kids of all ages. Good to see you. Um, how do you know somebody's made popcorn? How do you know? What's the main? You hear it. Yeah, Jay's going like this. You hear it. What else? You smell it, right? You smell it. Okay, well, today's story, today's gospel story, um, in it, Mary is giving a great honor to Jesus, and she puts, uh, she puts anointing oil on his uh, feet. And it is just a wonderful, apparently just an amazing smell that just filled the room. So I'm sure you can imagine it because when you, when you smell popcorn, right, you immediately, you, you, you know it and instantly you know. And so by them smelling this, this ointment, it was like, what's going on? You know, this was an unusual thing to have this very expensive uh, perfume to use it on someone's feet was, was just something really surprising. And here they were at dinner and, and all of that um, at this dinner party. Um, so everybody, I'm sure their ears kind of perked up. What is going on? What is this smell, this amazing smell? And it was Mary honoring Jesus, knowing that Jesus would, uh, was going to his death. She was honoring him with this uh, ointment. So I think it's really important for us to notice things. Notice where God is. Notice when people are honoring God and, and notice when and so that you can join in and be a part of it. And you can be part of that, that um, scent, that, that smell that uh, people will know that God is in the room. They'll sense it. They can almost smell it because of you and the love that you have for others. So always remember that. That's, that's how Christ lives on in us is that we share Christ with others, just like the smell of popcorn. <laughs> All right, so thank you. Thank you for coming. Please rise for the gospel. Judas willfully misinterprets as waste Mary's extravagant act of anointing Jesus' feet with costly perfume. Jesus recognizes that her lavish gift is both an expression of love and an anticipation of his burial. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She brought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Here are familiar words, I'll bet. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These are the words we heard as each person was marked with ashes in churches around the world as they gathered to worship on Ash Wednesday. I put ashes on people's faces of every age, from tiny babes to those with walkers. <laughs> and you, there's, there's a blessing in doing those two strokes of the cross. And saying, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This season, we confront our mortality head on. Let's face it, death is a part of our living. To be human is to live and to die. Now, when I was younger, I needed that reminder more than I do now. <laughs> Last week was the anniversary of my sister's death. And I'm sure that all of you, all of you have those that you are missing. And... Uh, if the process of aging doesn't already make us aware of our own mortality, which, you know, the gray hair and everything, um, an active global pandemic that's killed more than six million people will certainly make us aware. Aware that life can fall apart in the blink of an eye. Julian of Norwich, having survived the pandemic of her time, was a mystic. She was born in the mid-1300s, and she wrote the oldest recorded writing in English known to be written by a woman. There were probably others before that, but we didn't know they were women, whether they were women or not. Julian heard a message from God saying, and it, it may be familiar to you, all shall be well, and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. You see, she saw over half of the people of her city die of the bubonic plague. So she understands, she understood what we're talking about. She could not conceive how all manner of things could possibly ever be well. In the face of so much pain, suffering, and death, she said, it seemed to me impossible that every kind of thing should be well. Now, in our gospel story for today, Jesus has come to the home of his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Um, people with fresh knowledge of pain, suffering, and death. Right? These three siblings live in a town of Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem, where Jesus will spend the last week of his life. Now, as good friends and hosts do, they welcome Jesus and those he's traveling with into their home to enjoy a meal. So far, this sounds like a day kind of occurrence unless you're in a pandemic. <laughs> it's become quite rare. But there are some things going on behind the scene. For one thing, just a few days before this hospitable gathering, Lazarus was dead in a grave had been for four days. His sister had sent for Jesus, but Lazarus had died anyway, and Mary and Martha prepared his body for burial. They anointed him with oil and wrapped him in bands of cloth. Four days later, Jesus arrived. By this time, Mary and Martha were absolutely inconsolable. Weeping in their grief, they met him on the road, asking, where were you, don't you? How could you let this happen? What took you so long? Jesus asked them a question. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yes, of course. They say we believe in the resurrection at the end of days, but how does this help us now? Now, when the pain of their loss was unbearable, and Jesus must have agreed with how they felt because he also began to cry. But then things got really strange, <laughs> really weird. Jesus commanded the tomb to be opened, 
and called his friend to come out, and miracle of miracles, Lazarus walked out of the tomb alive again. You know, this dinner party really wasn't very normal at all to celebrate what had turned into weeping that turned into shouts of joy. What was dead was restored to life. They lived through their Easter moment, which was thoroughly good and worthy of celebration, except that the rest of us whose sorrow and loss have not yet, yet been so dramatically restored don't have that. For us, this promise of a good future may do little to make our present reality more bearable. Kate Bowler talks about this in her memoir, Everything Happens. Kate was a successful historian and professor at Duke Divinity School. She was 35 years old and doing what she loved. She was about to write a book and enjoying being a mother and a wife. She had a young son. One moment she was giving a lecture and the next she was receiving the diagnosis of an advanced and aggressive cancer. She says that she quickly realized that life is as fragile as a soap bubble. This crisis in Kate ignited a hyper-awareness in her. She became fully present in her life, and while devastated by the reality that she may very well not live long enough to live in her son's memories, she found herself primarily and overwhelmingly feeling love. Love became apparent all around her, and it sustained her. Kate writes, the terrible gift of the terrible illness is that it has in fact taught me to live in the moment. Nothing but this day matters. The warmth of the crib, the sound of my son's hysterical giggling, and when I look closely at my life, I realize that I am not just learning to seize the day. In my finite life, the mundane has begun to sparkle. <laughs> the things I love, the things I should love, become clearer, brighter. There's just so much beauty in the world. You notice your pain, but then you notice everybody else's the person struggling to reach something and the person that helps them, the person in the cancer clinic smoothing their mom's hair. And in all these moments, it feels like you just get flooded by how fragile and gorgeous and ridiculous life is. Kate began writing that book, knowing it very, may very well go unpublished. She chose to keep doing the things she loved with the people she loved for as long as she was able to be fully present to her life. No major changes. She simply lived, only more aware and more attentive to the beauty of it all. There had to be an intensity, an urgency, a hyper-awareness in that dinner party, don't you think? There had to be. You see, they not only experienced illness, death, and resurrection, they, they now lived with the knowledge of another looming death. The resurrection of Lazarus has drawn attention to the power players of the day, and this is the moment they decided that Jesus must die. They put a bounty on his head and put plans in place to arrest him, and they started spreading the word that anyone who knows of his whereabouts should tip them off. The threat of Jesus' death had to be hanging in the air as thickly as the smell of the oil Mary pours out to anoint his body in a brazen act of beauty. She poured the same kind of oil over her brother's body. Right? 
Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And so very many of us know, like Julian and Kate, that life is as fragile as a soap bubble. In a world with such deep sorrow, how can anything, let alone all things, be made well? Julian of Norwich spent 15 years in prayer and study, striving to understand what God meant by God's message that all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be made well. I think I left that on. The truth she discovered was this. I quote, Know it well. Love has meaning. Who reveals it to you? Love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why does he reveal it to you? For love. Remain in this and you will know more of the same. But you will never know different without end. So I was taught that love is our Lord's meaning. Love is our Lord's meaning. From dust we come and to dust we shall return, and love will sustain us through everything in between. The question is, knowing life is as fragile as a soap bubble, how then will these three siblings choose to live? Well, not entirely unlike how they lived before, right? Lazarus has opened his home just as he always did before. Martha's still in the kitchen, <laughs> preparing and serving a meal, right? Showing her love and care as she always has. Mary sits at Jesus' feet, soaking in the moment his presence, his teachings. And now, knowing that life can fall apart in an instant, let us choose, like Julian and Kate, like Mary and Martha, like Lazarus and Jesus, to live lives of expansive grace, full to the brim with love. Amen.
please join me in affirming our faith. I believe in beauty, beauty pulled into being, being by our creator. Beauty that catches our breath, beauty that turns us toward awe. I believe in courage, courage to believe, courage to stand up for the people we love, courage to love without hesitation. I believe in the Holy Spirit who prays for us when we cannot, who is brave for us when we are not. I believe in Jesus Christ, who stood up for Mary, who quieted the voice of critique, who welcomed every bid for relationship. I believe in God. I believe in God who believes in us. Amen. Let us pray. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. O oh God, do a new thing in the church. Free us from old ways that no longer serve the gospel and bring forward leaders who imagine fresh ways of doing ministry. Give us courage in the face of change Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing for creation. Reverse the trajectory of climate change and environmental catastrophe. Revive habitats already impaired by human disregard. Amplify the voices of climate scientists and researchers working to chart a new course. Open our eyes and guide our feet on paths toward your restored garden, O Lord. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing in our world. Break barriers that prevent political em enemies from working together for the well-being of all. Make a way for peace and collaboration among the nations. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a no new thing for those who suffer. Reveal a path for any who are unemployed or underemployed, for those experiencing homelessness, and for all who struggle with money. Comfort those who grieve and restore those who are sick, especially Joyce and Dot, Pastor Hayward, and all those others who are in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing within us, O oh God. Direct us into encounters that broaden our understanding of the human experience. Amplify voices that are ignored or devalued. Deliver us, especially from the scourge of racism. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing in our death, O oh God. Fill us with the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection as we give thanks for all the saints who have attained the prize of their heavenly call. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of the world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, thank you. All right, we will take a moment now for Holy Communion. So gather your bread and your wine. We'll do the same, and uh, we'll have communion. <laughs>
Jesus has always been one to invite. He said, drop your nets and follow me. He said, let the little children come. He said, stand up from your mat, you are healed. Jesus has always been one to invite, and that has not changed. So friends, you are invited to this table, each and every one of us with our doubts, our fears, our scars, our joy, our dreams, our hopes, our questions, we are invited to God's table. And here we will be met. Here we will be fed. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Here we are given a taste of an expansive life that is full to the brim with love, overflowing with joy. So come, not because you must, but because you can. Come, you are invited. This table is for you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Blessed Jesus, in this rich meal of grace, you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. The God of hope, fill us with joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ Jesus, the Word made flesh. Amen. Amen.